together, that we can sing such wonderful songs and be reminded of how truly great our God is, to be able to gather together as a family and worship our God, our Creator, our Father. And here on Sunday nights, we've been looking over, as far as our studies go, and lately been examining from the Book of Wisdom, also known as the Book of Proverbs, we've been looking at some lessons that we can learn from it, because as we've been discussing and as we've talked about, the world we live in with its challenges and the decisions that must be made, from this old sinful world and the reality from it. When we look at those things around us, a lot of times the challenges we find in our lives is because of the decisions we have to make. Do I make this decision or do I make that decision? That fork in the road, so to speak, and many times the wrong decision can lead to challenges, can it? And the book of Proverbs is all about how to make the right decisions, how to make those wise decisions. Last week, we talked about that which comes from Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7, where it said, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. The start of wisdom, the start of making those right decisions, the start of knowing the difference between a good decision and a bad decision begins by understanding the need for wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And last week, having talked about that, I thought it would be appropriate then to talk about the second most prolific thing that's discussed within the book of wisdom, and that is foolishness and the necessity laid upon us to flee foolishness. Throughout the scriptures, there's always a contrast between wisdom and foolishness, isn't it? Or folly, as it's sometimes called. The decision between that which is wise and the decision between that which is uh, foolish or uh, folly, if you will. And so today, we're going to look at the necessity found within those bad decisions, those foolish decisions, and how we can keep from making those. Within the book of Proverbs, though, in Proverbs chapter 9, we see an interesting layout being formed for us. We see on one hand, you have there in the first few verses where wisdom is being described, and which we'll look at in a moment, and then you go a few verses down to verses 13 through 18, and you see where folly or foolishness is being described. And so let's go ahead and look at that and start kind of examining that before we get into our lesson there in Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, we read this. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the high places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of my wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. When we look at this, of course, wisdom is being depicted as a female here. And it says, listen, she has a home that she has built. Now, as we remember that number seven is this number for perfection. God created the earth and the universe and all that is physical and those six days rested on the seventh. That is perfection. In other words, she has built the perfect house. And this home, the home she has created that is perfect, that is wisdom, she has and is inviting everyone to join her. The wise she wants with her, the simple or those lacking sense, she wants them to come in, but there's a condition, right? She set the table for them. She's prepared her home for those who are simple, those who are lacking sense. In other words, the ignorant of knowledge and lacking wisdom. The only thing she asks is this. Leave your simple ways and walk in the way of insight. Now let's contrast that starting in verse 13 with the woman of folly. The woman of folly or foolishness is loud. 
She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest place of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Here we have that contrast, don't we, to wisdom. Here's folly and, and what she has built. She's built a home also. Foolishness has built a home as well. It's not perfect. It doesn't have the seven pillars. No, it has a door, and from it she can come and go and go to the high places, and she calls out. She's loud. But she too calls out like wisdom and invites those who are simple, those who are ignorant, those who lack sense, she invites them into her home as well. But instead of making conditions that you must leave that life, she says, no, you don't have to leave it in my house. You can revel in it. That appetite for sin, you can be involved with it in her house. Defoe summed it up in a poem and based on this when he wrote this wherever god erects a house of prayer the devil surely builds a chapel there and it is found upon examination the latter as the longer congregation this reality is seen in foolishness isn't it? it's unfortunate but it's true far too many choose to go into the house of folly the house of foolishness rather than fleeing that home to the home of wisdom, the perfect home of God. Because foolishness is always knocking at the door of the ignorant to come in and to take part in that which is sinful and unrighteous, to make good evil and evil good. We're going to learn some lessons from her, from that which has built the house of foolishness. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at our lesson for tonight and look at our first point. We see from Proverbs 9, 13, foolishness actually knows nothing. Now, foolishness, it thinks it's wise. It thinks it knows everything, doesn't it? But it does not. The reality of foolishness is this. I have never met a foolish person who doesn't think they don't know everything. They think they know everything of every avenue, of every idea that has ever been. Though they lack understanding, though they don't know whatever the particular thing they are foolish in, they seem to present themselves as that. The reality is, as God states, they really know nothing. The woman folly, she's loud, she's seductive, and she knows nothing. Let's look at just a few ways. The proverb writer and others say, those who know nothing, the foolish, think their wives in. What ways do we find this to be the case? Are there any foolish ways, as we said, where they think they're wise, but they're not? The foolish think they are wise when they deny God and his existence, don't they? I have yet to find an atheist, again, that doesn't think they, he or she is the smartest person in the world that thinks they know absolutely everything and that everyone who could believe in God must be a complete moron and idiotic and ignorant of all things of life and death and seriousness and science. They must not know anything. Because how can you believe in God? How can you believe that there's evidence for him or anything along the lines? Those who believe that God does not exist, God says, simply put, they are foolish. The fool says in his heart, Psalm 14, 1, there is no God. 
They have to actually ignore science and ignore all the evidence to come to the conclusion. They have to be foolish to really believe God does not exist. But they will think they know it all. In Psalm 10 and verse 4, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Fools and foolishness. We find them in those who do not recognize God's greatness, his creation, and who he is. The foolish think they are wise when they deny God exists. It's amazing, though it hasn't been quite as much quite lately, but just a few years ago, there was a push, and it had over uh, 50,000 signatures from atheists to say that they wanted to stamp out anyone who believed in Christianity here in America. Just that they had to go. They're just not smart enough to live here. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They think they're wise, the agnostic and the atheist, but in reality, they're fools. Another foolish group are those that they think they're wise when they're not, when they deny God's plan of salvation. When the Jews first heard that there was this Jesus and that he actually was the Messiah and that they had killed him, we oftentimes focus on that 3,000 that obeyed the gospel that day who had their sins washed away by obedience through that watery grave and being raised to be in that uh, newness of life. We, we think of that 3,000, how amazing it was, but most people will say there were easily 10,000 in that area listening. 7,000 roughly. Listen to Peter and James and John. Talk about how to get to heaven, how to follow this one whom they had crucified and how the prophecies point to him and how, where salvation is found. And they said in their heart, this can't be the way. 7,000, most likely from all over the world, said, surely this isn't wise towards salvation. Paul would talk about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 20 and 21, talking about both the Jew and the Gentile who would reject Jesus as Savior when he said this, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. He said, listen, God seeing the foolishness of man and the way they can go, whether they're Jew or Gentile, said God chose what man thought was foolish in having God become man and be a perfect sacrifice and be our Lord and Savior, he chose that because he's wise. He chose the foolishness of the world to demonstrate his wisdom. The fool not only thinks there is no God, but the fool doesn't listen to God's word about how to obey the gospel. Thirdly, the foolish think they are wise when they suggest right is wrong and wrong is right. The proverb writer there in chapter 9, verse 17 said this, Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. In other words, what uh, she, this foolishness, this folly is saying, listen, it's better to partake in what is evil, what is stolen, what is illegal, because it's so much sweeter than that which is legal. And it's better. These are actually two old proverbs that are being quoted here. 
The stolen water is sweet. That which is illegal is, is sweeter because it's illegal and not legal. And then, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. That was an old proverb to say, listen, fornication, when done right, when hidden from the public, is pleasant. It's great. Or when the proverb writer said this in 10.23, Doing wrong is like a joke to the fool. <clears throat> Foolishness thinks it's wise when it says right is wrong and wrong is right. Of course, we remember that from Isaiah 5 and verse 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. The reality is, as we see there in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13, foolishness knows nothing. It thinks it's wise, it thinks it knows everything, but in all reality, the fool knows nothing. They're ignorant. They think improperly, and they know nothing. Unfortunately, as long as one stays a fool and rejects wisdom, there will always be those that think they are right. As Proverbs 12 points out, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Because the foolish always think they are right, they will always seek an audience. Again, we learn here from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 13 and following, that they will be the loudest ones. They're going to be the squeaky wheel, if you will. They're going to be, whether they're in the majority or the minority, they're going to be the loudest ones. I think right now, in the time we live, at least in my lifetime, I've never seen this more true. I've never seen foolishness so loudly proclaimed over and over and over. That no matter what truth is being stated, no matter what uh, facts are being given, foolishness seems to scream louder and be louder than anyone else. Again, as we look at Proverbs 9, 13, the woman folly is loud. It would go on to say there in verses 14 and 15, she sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of town. Why? Calling to those who pass by, you who are going straight in their way. She's screaming at them. This folly, this foolishness is screaming at the most of her, at the power of her lungs. Come into me. Join me. Don't look at wisdom. Don't find that. Come after me. Foolishness is loud. Again, Proverbs 29 and verse 9. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, notice this, the fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. You ever tried to reason with a foolish person? It's like banging your head against a wall, against a fence post. It doesn't matter what logic or reason. It doesn't matter if you say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and you show it in every conceivable factor of truth. They'll say, no, it doesn't. And the more you try to talk to them, the more you try to reason with them, the more you try to show that logic and even love towards them in that, the more they scream, the more they rage, the louder they get. No, it's not. It seems more and more every day the loudest and the most outspoken are the most foolish of our society. Those who know nothing of history or economics clamor for socialism or immorality by the bucket fools. And the number of uh, just simple unfathomable inventions of evil, as Romans 1 would put it, that comes out seems to be growing every single day. 
And unfortunately, these people are the loudest. I wish they would heed Solomon's advice in Proverbs 30 and verse 32, where he said, listen, those who are like this, they need to put their hand over their mouth. They should be the ones who are quiet. They should be the ones who are silent. But unfortunately, as you and I know, that's simply not the case. However, the reason why it is done, the reason why that choice is made to folly, or excuse me, to follow this avenue of folly, to follow this avenue of foolishness is because the fact is, is it gains an audience. Because it preys on those who are lacking sense. Notice again what folly thinks of the ignorant fools there in Proverbs 9 and verse 16. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear unto him who lacks sense. She, folly here, foolishness, who has built this house, really a house of cars, but has made it look glamorous, has made it look wonderful. She's calling people in, but she's calling those whom she knows who are simple, who lack sense. That word simple there means easily manipulated. Don't think for themselves, in other words, but simply follow whatever the trend is. She looks at those she brings in and says, I know if I scream loud enough, they will come. Unfortunately, there are far too many who fall prey to her loud screams, to folly or foolishness, uh, gestures and wants and accommodations. What are some of those or who are some of those that she preys on? We learn from the scriptures that Foolishness preys on the young. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 7, we read this, And I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Young people, unfortunately, and again, we see this in our society today, they lack sense, don't they? They're foolish. I remember one time a, a gentleman asked a, a young college girl and said, you know, uh, asked her a number of questions. One of the questions he asked her, he said, are you for uh, free rent? She said, sure. He said, are you for free education? She said, sure. He said, okay, well, let's look at that education one for a second. Are you for, he said, do you make good grades? She said, yeah, I make straight A's. He said, okay, are you for taking your grades as high A's and, and uh, giving your points to those who are lower so that everyone equals out in the middle. And she said, no, I work hard for that. So you're not for really free education. You're not really for this free. You understand what's going on. The youth get trapped because of a lack of sense. And the fools and the foolish, they prey on you. They prey on them, they seek after them, they strive to devour them, and foolish wants them a part of her home. Foolishness also preys on the sluggard. In Proverbs 24 and verse 30 it says, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. The sluggard is the one who lacks sense. He thinks, why is it though I haven't worked on the field, I haven't done anything for the vineyard, why is it not producing? Proverbs 12 and verse 11, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. In other words, the one who sees what needs to be done, sees what is needed to make things work, what is wise and needed to get through this life that God has asked us to do, but yet they follow the whims of their own ideas, the whims of this life, they lack sense. The sluggard or the lazy, they fall prey to foolishness's desire for them to enter her home. It also preys on the proud. In Ecclesiastes 4.13, Solomon will write that, Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. Far too many 
because of pride, make foolish decisions and allow themselves to enter into the home of folly and foolishness. Foolishness seeks an audience. It doesn't know anything and is lacking wisdom in every area, but nevertheless, it wants an audience and it will be the loudest. And the reality is the foolish hate knowledge and thus wisdom. Again, the proverb writer in 122, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Because foolishness always thinks it's right and seeks to spread its foolishness. We find from our text there in Proverbs chapter 9 that foolishness will ultimately bring death. Because its goals are not based in righteousness, they're based in ignorance and sin, foolishness' home is built with a bunch of guests that are in Sheol. Now, Sheol in the Old Testament typically deals with death, grave, or uh, most often hell, where we would say uh, Hades, or excuse me, uh, Tartarus or Gehenna there, which is hell in the New Testament. Sheol is a lot of times, most of the time, that in the Old Testament. The foolish don't realize it. Those who see their open door that she has made and the home that she uh, acts like she's providing, they enter in, but they don't know they're on the road to hell, the spiritual death. Again, look at Proverbs 9, verse 18 there. But he does not know. He that enters fool, the folly's house does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. The reality is foolishness always brings death. In Proverbs 7, 27, we, re we read this. Her house is the way of Sheol, going down to the chambers of of death. Again, if you go to chapter 2 and verse 18, for her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. And then again in 21 and verse 16, the one who wanders from the way of good sense will rest in the assembly of the dead. Foolishness, though in the momentary sense of pleasure that sin can bring seems wonderful for a time. It always, every single time, eventually will lead to death. A spiritual death that we cannot get away from. Eventual end for the foolish is without a doubt not the heavenly home that God the Father, the Son, and Spirit have prepared. No, it's the opposite. No, Sheol, or spiritual death, hell, is as, far, is as far away from God as the east is from the west. Unlike wisdom, foolishness thinks it knows everything, while all along knows nothing. And she spreads her ignorant foolishness as far and as wide as she possibly can, trying to bring as many into her snare as will listen to her screaming voice. But to those who see past her vitriol ignorance and learn from wisdom, there isn't, uh, there isn't a guarantee of death, but rather that of life. The reason you and I study God's word, the reason you and I look towards God, and the reason we follow him is because where wisdom is, life is found. And the best possible life, not only here on earth, but especially for eternity, is in the wisdom that is found in God. How do we get wisdom? Well, the beginning is get wisdom. Go to God's Word. Learn from the book of wisdom. Those here who have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation have tasted wisdom and know what it's like. Let not only us, but all those we know 
let us make sure and we not only remember in our lives the bountiful pleasures that wisdom brings, but we help others do the same. That as many people as we come in contact with, we help liberate them from foolishness and offer them the better way, the way, the truth, and the life. Because that is the only way of wisdom. The only way to eternity in heaven. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This evening as you reflect upon your walk with God. The decisions you've been making. The reality is you and I both know we're going to make some foolish decisions here and there. But the most foolish decision we can make is to not repent. To not correct. And not confess those sins to God. To not have our sins, those foolish choices we've made, to not have those corrected in our lives. If there's someone here who needs to make that correction, make it now. Go to God. Repent of your foolishness. Seek and pray for wisdom, James 1, that he may deliver it to you and let us help you. Let us strengthen you. Let this church be that for you. There's someone here who simply needs the prayers of this congregation, the encouragement and the strength that comes with this family. Let us be that for you as well. Seek the wisdom God has given you in those here to be that strength for you in your time of need. So this evening, flee foolishness, give wisdom, and allow the church here to help you if you are in need by coming forward and letting us know as we stand and as we sing.